If you're listening to this on YouTube, this episode is one week delayed. Up-to-date Tech Show But Friendly episodes are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. This is Tech Show But Friendly, Hardware Sugars Podcast, and I'm your host, Anton, and we'll jump right into it with the story of how the PNP got hacked. Although, the government is disputing that it was actually hacked, which might not be a good thing. I mean, you think, okay, there was a hack. No, it wasn't a hack. Then that's better. But actually, it might even be worse. So, what was hacked or what information was accessed? Apparently, over 1.2 million records of people who applied to work with the police or are actually working at the PNP were all in a publicly accessible database. So this database was not secured, it was not password protected, it was not encrypted. Apparently, anybody who strolled over to the PNP employment portal could access it. Not to say that there were links pointing to this database. It's not clear from the security analyst who discovered this flaw how exactly you could uncover the database. But it's clear that the database was pub publicly accessible. And what was in this database? So over 1.2 million records, records spanning birth certificates, grades, transcript of records, marriage certificates, TIN numbers. So basically all of the basic kind of documents that you would forward to a potential employer. We're talking passports, driver's license, really all of these basic documents that have all of our details that we use to authenticate ourselves. Per the foreign security analyst who discovered this flaw, and perhaps it's not accurate to call it a flaw, more like a vulnerability. Or basically, you, you have a valuable which you failed to lock up, which you left outdoors. So I wouldn't even call that a security flaw, more like a blunder, <laughs> a mishap, something that was, you know, you were supposed to do something and you forgot to do it. So not even the most basic of encryption was on this database with over 1.2 million records. And according to the foreign analyst who did find this mishap, this was open to the public, publicly accessible for at least six weeks before the database was hidden behind some kind of security. And so that's why per our DICT, it wasn't a hack, meaning there wasn't a intrusion into a purportedly secure network because it wasn't secure to begin with. I mean, literally, this data was just hanging out for out, hanging out in the open for anyone to access. So yes, I mean, if you want to split hairs, you could argue that there wasn't a hack. So because a hack implies that there was security and security was breached. In this case, there was no security. But if you define a hack more broadly as the access of information by people who should not have access to the information, which I think would be a generally accepted definition of hacking. Maybe not in the strict sense, but definitely in the intrusion of privacy sense, then yes, there was a hack. But even more so than was it a hack or not, it, you know, let's not split hairs anymore. There's, it's not in question that there was a lot of personal data that was submitted to the PNP, entrusted to the PNP, by the people who were applying with them or people who are actually employed with them now. So there was a handoff of data from the individual to the institution, and it's clear that the institution had a responsibility to safeguard that data, essentially to make sure that they locked up something valuable. So again, to go back to a real-world analogy, let's say you have an expensive watch and you just don't leave that watch lying around whatever on the counter you put it away in a safe. And that just wasn't done here. The data was not properly put away or it wasn't properly secured. And on one hand, what's new, right? I mean, we're all used to, if you live in the Philippines, we're all used to government agencies going awry. I mean, they request so many things from, the, from us, from the citizens of the country, but they themselves are not particularly good at upholding the standards that they themselves put for themselves. Yung sobrang basic lang ng mga documents, getting your driver's license renewed, for example, getting a business permit. Yung dapat sobrang basic lang na transactions, ang hirap pa rin gawin. Even, you know, we're, it's 2023, the internet was around 1995, so we've had more than 20 years of attempts to make things digital. Supposedly digital, mas madali para sa mga mamamayan. And yet, you know, it's 
every simple thing is just so darn hard here. And you hear about something like this and you just shrug your shoulders and you go, well, garon talaga. But actually, I don't blame the PNP. <laughs> so that's, that's where the title of this episode comes in. Like, the PNP got hacked, but I can't blame them. And it, to be honest, that's my true sentiment on it. Uh, because it's very difficult to deal with the public in the Philippines. And I'm not talking about like if we're unruly, if we don't follow the rules. I'm just talking about the number of Filipinos. I think we're around 110 million people. And just even and dealing with the basic bureaucracy to set up systems in place to deal with the volume of people that you need to deal with who are asking for NBI clearance, who are applying to the PNP, who are applying to renew your driver's license. And then you're doing it on such a limited budget. I keep bringing up the driver's license thing because... It's a perfect example of how difficult it is to do an IT-based project that is forward-facing. Kumbaga, if the citizens are the customers of government, driver's licenses would be the product. It's something forward-facing, something that we, the citizens, have to interact with the government to get. So parang we're paying the government to get a driver's license. And if it were a private business, madali lang yun, diba? Yung negosyo is testing people and then you get issued a plastic card. For a private, for-profit entity, that would be easy to do because you're charging the price, the actual cost of the good, the actual cost of testing, of processing people, of issuing the license, of the raw materials for the license, of the IT databases that you need to properly manage this large number of people. But then you have IT budgets for government agencies, which just aren't sufficient to come up with the mechanisms in place. And again, I go back to LTO. The LTO IT provider for the longest time was Stradcom. I, I think, if I remember correctly, the company's name was Stradcom. But the LTO officials decided to terminate Stradcom's license, sorry, contract, because they weren't happy with the quality of the service being provided by Stradcom. Stradcom was like, okay, fine, take over. So the LTO did try to take over, but basically found it impossible. <laughs> Either they couldn't find another provider, their in-house people couldn't do it. Because yun nga, coming up with IT systems for this many people, imagine the back end of that, the front end of that, it's a mess. So in the end, LTO had to come back to Stradcom and ask them, please come back and please take over the IT services again. And so they had to polish up the contract or something. But that has led to catching up with the data for the period that Stradcom wasn't around. And that doesn't even address the earlier concerns of LTO that Stradcom wasn't providing the quality of service that they needed. Basically, it boils down to, mahirap talaga, and we don't have the money to properly throw at the problem. Whether it's LTO, whether it's the PNP asking basic employment records and failing to secure those records, it was so bad that the PNP IT was not even aware <laughs> that they had a database of employ of those records. So whoever was in charge of that operation basically went uh, on a rogue operation. Okay, we're going to collect this data, but then didn't properly encrypt it, didn't properly secure it, and didn't even properly run it by their own internal IT department. So mahirap talaga, especially since we don't have the funds necessary to come up with a with systems that can properly deal with this volume. I'm not sure about the number of providers. Yun nga, Stradcom was axed by LTO, but they couldn't find anybody else willing to take it up, maybe for that budget. Because we don't lack in IT personnel. What we lack, perhaps, is the experience for large-scale systems like that. I'm, you know, Again, I, I don't want to overly speculate, but large systems like that, you know, not any run-of-the-mill IT company or developer can do it. And it's not just us. A lot of governments, even first world countries, run into difficulties with establishing IT systems that need to be accessed by their citizenry. Case in point, the US. During Obama's time, he passed a law saying that, okay, everybody needs to have medical insurance. So that was universal health care. And it was a really big push for the Democrats, especially the president in particular. That was a signature program by him. He burned a lot of political capital because when he was first elected, there was a lot of goodwill. He could have gotten a lot done. 
and you know the US has a lot of problems gun control uh, but defense spending poor school testing scores I mean there are a lot of problems in the US but one of the chief concerns that Obama decided to tackle early on was universal health care and it was a very contentious issue but he was able to get the law passed through Congress and through the Senate the problem now was implementation and their big idea was you could go to a website any so as an American citizen, I'm now required to have health insurance. Where do I find that? Para mura, I would theoretically be able to go to this website and all of the providers would be there already. So I could see at a glance, oh, it's pinakamura. Or ito, hindi ganun kamura, but it has the coverage that I want, that I need. So it's giving the consumer, giving the citizen, all the necessary information that he or she needs to make a proper decision. Uh, so it sounds super simple, right? Website that can handle millions of inquiries, transactions per minute, per second. And no problem for the U.S. government, which has a budget of gazillions of, of dollars. I mean, you know, you don't mind spending $1.2 on a fighter jet. I'm sure coming up with a website that can deal with that should be easy, right? But the universal healthcare website, I forget the exact uh, URL, almost failed. Before it went live to the public, people were testing it and they were saying that this is crap. Like, we, we need a website that can handle just, for example, 100 million simultaneous users. Probably not 100 million, but you know, something like that. Like, a, a website that can handle this heavy load. And it just wasn't doing it. The, the website that the developers or the, I, I forget who the initial developers were, the initial product that they came up with was just not doing the job. And this was a potential disaster. Imagine you have, you've spent so much political capital, you've staked your reputation that yes, this is the way forward. You would be crucified by your political opponents if after all of that effort and argument and budget, if the very vehicle by which you can get this law implemented is so faulty, is so buggy. And in the end, what they turned to was, I don't know how they got involved. I think basically the, one of the people with general oversight over the universal healthcare website was like, this is crap. This is not going to work. So he actually called in friends. It was literally a call in your friend moment in his life where, you know, I know people from Google. I know people from, you know, these really smart guys who are used to handling websites, systems, IT databases that can handle this large crush of people and it's and you think about it if you're listening to this on spotify on apple and google or on youtube the amount of data that these private companies need to process per second is tremendous and yet as customers we barely appreciate that fact we complain when it's down but when it's up it's just like second nature to us it's like breathing we don't think about it anymore but actually the uptime of these websites is phenomenal. When you go onto Amazon and it's just there and it's so fast, you search on Google, you know, we don't think about it anymore, but it's a Herculean effort to have these kind of databases that can handle that load. So this guy called in friends. He, they called in the private sector and they're like, guys, you really need your help. This, pro this, this website is not working. And it wasn't even for compensation. If I remember the story correctly, these coders who worked on the healthcare website, the public, I mean, it was a, it's a public project, but they were brought in like literally last minute. Like it was a Hail Mary pass to get this website working. And they did it. Like the super smart people who got involved in that, who basically volunteered their time and, and man hours. Yun nga, parang overtime na to, parang crunch time, kasi may deadline that the website had to be online. And they got the job done. They were able to overhaul the system which was not working initially. And so when the healthcare website launched, it was able to handle the volume of traffic that, that it experienced. And there were very few complaints about from, from Americans, from citizens who were trying to, okay, I'm now required. The law required me. Now I need to comply. This is how I comply by going through this website. And actually, dun ako naiinis sa gobyerno natin. It's not so much, I understand, mahirap talaga to make up, to, to develop these kind of systems. Naiinis ako na, you're making us comply through these systems that don't work. I mean, 
can't we come up with a una if you're making us comply but there's no easy way for us to comply that's not fair that's not a good law that's not a good way of governance because all of the burden is shifted towards the citizen na hindi naman dapat we want to comply we want to follow with the law and yet the process by which you're telling us to follow is faulty is super yeah it's, it just doesn't work i mean whether it's getting your license renewed whether it's getting your passport renewed whether it's a business permit i mean sobrang simple lang dapat ng mga to and yet so many things are required so many hoops to jump through if your it systems are not working then either get us a better it system or don't ask these requirements from us dun ako niinis and i don't blame the pnp for having this unsecured database, which was just basically hanging out there, IT is hard. IT at scale is hard. But then kung ganun, come up with a better system. Maybe not, don't ask us to pass it online if they're employment records. Maybe don't even ask us to submit all of these records. Does the PNP really need my marriage certificate? Does the PNP really need my transcript of records? And, if, and I'm sure somebody in the audience is saying, yes, we need all of that. Eh, good. If that's what you need, then give us a secure way to upload that. Diba? Yun nga, I'm not saying you're the ones who can tell us what you need. But if you say that you need those things, then give us an easy, secure way to give you those things. We want to comply. We want to follow the law. <laughs> we want to get our driver's license renewed. And, but, you know, if it's you go through the motions and then you get this laminated thing, which apparently may shortage now of the plastic being used for driver's licenses. Again, it's an IT thing, it's a logistics thing. And if you get your license renewed now, some people have been reporting, basically you get cardboard that's laminated, a temporary driver's license. I mean, what a joke. <laughs> Why not just slap a sticker on the old license? I guarantee you, if you're applying, if you're getting your license renewed, may licensya ka na, may plastic license ka na. But pa tayo magpapatawa na gagawa pa ng cardboard license and then ipapalaminate. Mas mura pa yung sticker, lagay mo lang yung sticker. Oh, then, oh the sticker is so easy to fabricate, madaling i-counterfeit. Eh, ano tawag mo dyan sa laminated license? Yun nga, it's, we find reasons to justify why we need so many things, why we need all of these things. When, at the end of the day, if we can't properly receive what the... Sorry. Let me rephrase. If the government can't properly receive what they're asking, what it's asking from its citizens, then that's not a valid request. I mean, it should be something that we, the people, can comply with. And that if we've complied with everything, we should get the service promptly and efficiently and not get like, again, the driver's license. I mean, come on, man. This is 2023. Yeah, I mean, I don't... IT is hard. IT at scale is even harder. Lots of richer governments have tried and have failed. But then, let's be realistic. Um, if we're asking certain things and we can't secure those certain things, we can't process the transactions at the speed they should be reasonably expected to be processed at, then let's not ask for so many requirements. Then let's not burden the citizens with requirements that we, the government, don't even look at, don't even secure anyway. So, diba, parang, let's be realistic about what we can do with the budget that we have. And let's try to place the same demands on ourselves, talking about government, that we place on our citizens. Kung marami kang hinihingi from the citizen, di dapat ganun din kabilis yung response mo. Kung gano kahirap yung rinirequire mo sa citizens, then dapat ganun din ka-efficient yung reply mo on that matter. I mean, it's, it's, it seems based some fundamentally unfair that a lot of barriers are thrown in front of us for us just to get basic things. And then after we've gone through all of those barriers, government can't even give us those basic things in a reasonable amount of time. That's what's frustrating. And again, I can actually sympathize with the PNP. It's not, again, IT is hard. IT at scale is hard. But then... The solution, if it's not an IT solution, maybe it can be a, a human solution. Let's cut back on the things we're asking for. Let's focus on the speedy release of whatever permit or application or license is pending before the office. 
We don't have money to throw at the problem, but there are other solutions that we can try at this problem compared to just placing the burden on the citizens and just hoping that ah, marami tayong rin require So hopefully, konti lang yung mag apply para dito. Or because we put so many barriers in place, the number of people coming to us, while the total volume might be the same, the staggered volume of how, or how many people actually show up per day is less because it's so difficult to get all of these requirements that we're asking for. So there are solutions that we can try. Yun nga, I'm not even saying that these are the proper solutions. But definitely, whatever it is we're doing as a mindset is not working. Wala tayo pera pang large-scale IT budget. Then what can we do to streamline the data going into the IT system so that the IT system doesn't need to be so big to begin with? For licenses, maybe extend the validity period. Auto-renewal if you don't have a ticket or something. Uh, actually... <laughs> Parang from PNP, I've shifted to LTO, and I do have a lot of frustrations with the LTO. But I guess that's a thing for another podcast. And we'll leave IT for now. I think I just realized that we're around 10, 20 minutes in or so into the podcast. I didn't realize I'd spent so long on that. It is a frustrating problem. Just, just last words. It is a frustrating problem. I don't blame government so much for the inadequacy of its IT systems. But more for the fact that no one is thinking of solutions how to work with the inadequacy of those IT systems. Parang sa kanila, they just keep piling on more needs on the already very strained IT systems. Um, and you know, maybe we can, yeah, perhaps the better way would be to try to streamline the data going into the IT system in the first place. What definitely needs to be streamlined or, okay, maybe awkward segue, but definitely something needs to be done about the 700, 7800X 3D. And why is that? That's the newest CPU from AMD. Uh, I talked about it last week, how it's probably the best gaming CPU right now. Although, problems have cropped up. There was a post on Reddit, and where else? It's always on Reddit, that he bought a 7800X 3D. This is a very difficult number for me to say. I, I, you, I've lost track of how many times I've had to edit out because I keep slurring 7800X3D. But anyway, the 7800X3D, he paired it with a Asus ROG 67, X670E motherboard. So the, if, you, if you saw our video on that, magkaiba pa yung X670 at yung X670E. So the E version is like the latest and the greatest talaga. Uh, spared no expense. And actually, we have a build coming up where it's a 7950X3D and the ROG X670E Crosshair Extreme, I think, or something. But we'll, we'll talk about that build um, on another podcast or in, in, in another piece of our content. But anyway, the user paired those two. He came home. The PC wasn't working. Upon inspection, the CPU was fried. In fact, it was so deformed that there was a bulge, a noticeable bulge in the CPU square. And... So he posted about it on Reddit. More people came forward, and now Gamers Nexus has secured the. I'm not sure if that was the hardware of that particular post, or basically some hardware that had the same symptoms. So an 7800X3D with an ASUS motherboard. The suspicion now is that the ASUS, the BIOS of these ASUS motherboards, is pumping too much voltage into the CPU. The, there's some speculation that the BIOS is overly aggressive in trying to get better CPU speeds. This has been fueled in part because the, the repository or the list of ASUS BIOS for these motherboards has been undergoing a lot of changes. A lot of BIOS versions have been deleted. There are only a couple left on hand. And then these are constantly or have been replaced quite quickly in the past few days. So there is evidence of ASUS at least. There has been there have been reports as well on ASRock motherboards, but ASUS seems to be the majority of the reports. And there is circumstantial evidence to suggest that ASUS has been rapidly trying to find a good version of the BIOS that might n prevent this from occurring. So again, this is very speculative. Everybody is sort of waiting for the Gamers Nexus. It's kind of amazing. I mean, if, you, if you're not familiar with Gamers Nexus, there's this 
there is this YouTube channel that is very hardware focused and they really do deep dives. So LTT Linus Tech Tips is sort of very general, uh, beginner friendly information. Gamers Nexus is a very deep dive. He throws a lot of jargon and figures and benchmarking things at you. But it's interesting that Gamers Nexus has become sort of the referee when it comes to things like this. So there's been a lot of burning <laughs> lately for new hardware. Where, of course, you know, we think about the launch of the NVIDIA 40 series with the adapter cable for the new type of power connector. There, the 7000 series also of AMD reported some, some fire issues or you know, inability to cool issues. And now the latest would be the 7800X3D. To be fair, it's not clear yet where the fault lies, but the advice now is to make sure, especially if you have an Asus motherboard, that your BIOS is updated. On AMD's end, they were quite clear that we, we don't want you to be pushing a lot of voltage into these new chips. In fact, I think they disabled overclocking. Or, the, or I'm not sure if they meant the EC overclock tool that has become kind of widespread lately for the current generation or, you know, the, the CPUs that have come out in the past five years or so. This is a niche problem. Not many people are upgrading yet to the 7800X3D. And not too many people would be sporting a ROG X670E motherboard. But the internet was as... as as is usual with hardware news and, you know, you have a lot of hardcore people. Uh, everybody jumped on it. Um, there's been a lot of jumping on, on ASUS on, like, why, you know, why, are your, why, why is your BIOS like that? Your BIOS is faulty. Again, we're just reporting on the general speculation. There's nothing definitive yet. But this is a very theoretical problem for a lot of our listeners who probably are not thinking or do not have a 7800X3D uh, on hand, let alone an X670E mobile from ASUS. That being said, if you do, please do update your BIOS. And if you do have a hankering for this so hot system that it can literally combust, <laughs> we can get it for you. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we actually do have the 7800X3D now in stock. Uh, we and are about to do a build with the 7950X3D and the ROG X670E. So, but we'll, be, we'll make sure to update the BIOS on that. And of course, follow the news to see how we can avoid <laughs> this very expensive rig. I mean, it's like, um, I think the 7950X3D was around 40 plus. The motherboard was definitely around 50 plus. So that's almost close to 100,000 pesos in hardware that can both potentially go up in smoke without any fault of the user. Just because the basic programming language of the motherboard, i.e. the BIOS, is sending it wrong instructions or, you know, is sending instructions, is sending it suicidal instructions. <laughs> Putting that out there, we'll probably be talking about it more in the coming weeks when Gamers Nexus comes out with its findings. And the last hardware news for this podcast is that MSI released a 3060Ti card in China, which it had to recall on the request of NVIDIA. And the reason was not hardware, the reason was marketing. Because MSI called this particular 3060 Ti card the RTX 3060 Ti Super 3X. And if you remember the NVIDIA cards from the 10 series and the 20 series, NVIDIA had a bunch of cards that had Super attached to them. Like it was literally part of their name. So the 1660 Super is different from the 1660. And we do have a video about this in the past. And Generally, when you put Super there, ganda ng performance upgrade over the classic version of that card. So the 1660 Super does a lot better than the 1660, for example. And although I think there was one exception. I can't quite remember, but I think it might have been the 2060 Super, if I'm remembering correctly. We, the, we did a video on that last year on, on the entire NVIDIA line. And you can check it out um, on our YouTube channel. But MSI released this card just in China and NVIDIA, it had already gone out. So they were, they were starting to sell it. But then NVIDIA was like, hey, no, stop that. Um, and speculation, and I agree with the speculation, is probably because NVIDIA was worried that people would get the wrong idea that, ui, may 3060 Ti super na pala. Which actually, 
doesn't even follow the naming convention because the TIs never get a super version. It's usually the vanilla card, say, for example, the 2060, and then there's a super version of that. But I don't recall any TI cards or Thai cards, as NVIDIA likes to call them, that got the super version. But NVIDIA complained, MSI complied. Although I guess it's hard. You really don't have to comply when NVIDIA complains. So they pulled the cards from the market. I think supposedly what MSI was going for was that this was a three-fan version of the 3060 Ti. So that's why they wanted to, you know, kind of emphasize that this is a this is a version of this card that, you know, can handle performance. So it's super. Except that super already has certain connotations for people who follow NVIDIA cards. And it's it's kind of like um it's a mistake that could have been corrected before it was made. I mean, even if you didn't get specific guidance from NVIDIA, you've been making NVIDIA cards for so long, you're aware. I mean, MSI is aware of what the Super means in relation to the other NVIDIA cards. I don't know if this, it was just some marketing guy who didn't know his hardware and he was just like, yeah, well, we want to say that this is great and what better way to boost sales than slapping the word Super on it. Um, but you can't buy it anymore. Uh, MSI has pulled it. It will probably release the card again but under a different name. So a real-world example of a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet, as Shakespeare says. And, and the point of that line from Romeo and Juliet is that it doesn't matter what you name things. A rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. Like you could name, a rose could be called earphone and it would still smell just as sweet. But names, words do matter. And as was seen in, the, in this uh, contemporary case of MSI pulling out the its 3060 Ti Super card. So if you ever hear anybody selling you a 3060 Ti Super, that might be true, but it's just in the name. Thanks so much for listening to Talk Show But Friendly. Catch us again next week, every Friday. Enjoy your day, enjoy your week. Stay safe, everyone.